this morning, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14, and see God's promise to Ahaz, but not only to Ahaz, but to the entire world, that the virgin would be with child, give birth to a son, and they will call his name Jesus. We anticipate that first coming. We anticipate the second coming in glory, and we anticipate his coming to us each day in word and sacrament. That's the meaning of Advent. He comes to us. Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. Beloved in, lo in the Lord, it, it is Advent. It's a time when we as Christ Church begin to quiver with anticipation as we begin once again the church year and re-excite ourselves and acquaint ourselves with all the great works of salvation that God has done for us in Jesus. Advent, which begins the year, is a time of preparation and a time of anticipation. It's a time when we, the Advent Church, look for our Savior to come again in glory as once he came long ago and was born a child in Bethlehem. Advent for us is a threefold Advent. First of all, we remember the Lord's first coming, his first Advent. We look with anticipation to his second coming, his second Advent. And we rejoice in his daily coming through word and sacrament. That's Advent, and the church encompasses all three facets of Advent as we come to this holy season of anticipation, waiting expectantly for it all to begin again as we set up our Christmas trees and lay out our decorations and set our Advent wreaths on our table and the nativity creations go up and we remember in a sacred way what God has done for us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so at Advent, we pray, Come, dear child of promise. Come. You know, 700 years before Christ was born, God chose Isaiah to preach the word of the Lord to a stubborn and a very difficult people, the people of Judah. God had continued to love them in mercy and grace, although again and again they showed their disregard for God by turning their back and going their own ways. And in the time of Isaiah, 700 years before that birth, God sent Isaiah to an evil king in Judah named Ahaz. Ahaz had ascended to the throne of Judah at the age of 20. And he had married a princess, a Canaanite princess from Phoenicia. Her name was Jezebel. And he had run the community of Israel into the ground. He'd set up false idols of the Canaanites on every street corner in Jerusalem. The temple was no longer dedicated to the God of Israel, whose personal name was Yahweh. I am who I am. And he was a political nightmare because, you see, the northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom in Damascus gathered together and put political pressure through the, through the, uh, through the threat of force, through invasion, on him to join in a league against the mighty Assyrian Empire. And he buckled under pressure. He didn't turn to the Lord, you see. He turned instead to advisors. He turned instead to his own mind. He turned to his lack of political savvy. And what do you suppose he did? But he went around to those two kingdoms and he approached Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, to come to his aid, to propose an alliance 
so that he could get the northern kingdom of Israel and Damascus off his back. And Isaiah and his son approached him as he was reviewing the fortifications in preparation for a siege. During the time going through the tunnel of Hezekiah, look, looking at the water system of, of Jerusalem, and Isaiah came to him, and he said to him, the words that we find in Isaiah chapter 7. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, hear now you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. Ahaz was a deplorable king. Ahaz not only worshipped the false gods of Canaan, Ahaz had sacrificed two of his sons in the fire to the god Molech in order to gain their favor that he might have his power by the false gods of Canaan. And yet God the Lord came to him, not in anger, not in judgment. He came to him in his mercy and grace in his overabundance of love. And he said, Ahaz, I still love you. And Judah, I still love you. I'm going to give you a sign so that you might know my love. Ask for me anything you want, and it's yours. He could have asked for his enemies to be defeated. He could have asked to be the greatest kingdom in the world. But what did Ahaz do? In pious sounding words, he rebuked Isaiah and the God who sent him. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now when God comes to you and I, and should he offer to give us anything we ask for in our prayers. If we rebuke him and say, oh no Lord, I don't want anything from you. In God's sight, that's a terrible sin. Because God wants to give Ahaz something. He wants to give Judah a wonderful blessing. He remembers his promise to Abraham. And to Noah. And to Adam. And even to the family of David. But Ahaz will have none of that. You see. Easy for God to smite Ahaz right then. And maybe our human nature might want to say, yeah, get him, Lord. Zap him. The lightning comes down from heaven. But no, that's not God's response, is it? God does not come in judgment. He comes to Ahaz in blessing as he comes to us in blessing. For Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the world, but to save it. And so God is going to give not only to Ahaz, not only to Judah, but in the sight of all the nations of the world, a sign for everyone. The virgin, not a virgin, the virgin. Not a young maiden, although that's a part of it. But a young maiden whose primary quality and characteristic is virginity. I will give the virgin, the seed of Genesis 3, a child. That seed that I had so long ago promised. 
the virgin will bear a son. And they will call him. They will refer to him. They will speak about him. His name, his title will be Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. What do we do with that? If you look at all of the scripture in the Old Testament, everything written by the prophets and Moses and Joshua, all of them, you will not see that promise fulfilled until, until the last and greatest prophecy of the Old Testament and more than a prophecy, an annunciation. For the angel Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord, who promised to Adam and Eve, who promised to Noah and to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Ahaz and all the way down, has not forgotten the line of David. And although it has been brought down to nothing, an old decaying stump. God will bring forth from that stump a shoot. And the angel appeared to a virgin who lived in Nazareth, the house of David. And he announced to her, you will have a son. Talk about anticipation. Talk about excitement. Talk about preparation. What is she going to do? She's overwhelmed. She doesn't, like Ahaz, discard the Lord's word. No. Mary, you see, has the heart that David had. Humble. Obedient. She bows to the Lord. I am the Lord's handmaiden. She doesn't know how God will do it. It doesn't really matter, does it? He will overshadow her, the scripture says, with the Holy Spirit. And this holy seed that will be conceived will be from God. But she simply says, let it be to me as you have said. And she anticipates, and we anticipate, year after year we anticipate, and we celebrate, and the decorations go up, and the tree is lit, for the light of the world has come. And the evergreens remind us of everlasting life, and the triangular shape calls our attention to God. And we look to that first coming and blessing, when Jesus, the Son of God, came into a world of people just like Ahaz. People who turn their back on God. People who create their own sense of truth. People who go about wanting what they want, regardless of what God wants. He came, in fact, to you and me. To poor and miserable sinners. And he came in blessing. And he came in love. And that little manger became a cross. And upon that cross he was born to die. <clears throat> for your sins and mine. No matter how big, no matter how great, no matter how impossible they may seem, God came to us in that little child of promise that he might die in our place and give us the gift of faith that in trusting in that cross and that, that salvation and that empty tomb you and I you see you and I are forgiven and we because of that gift of faith have everlasting life right now and no one can take that away from you 
because it is yours. Ask the Lord for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. And God came to us and he reached down to us in our selfishness, in our selfish ambition. And he said, I love you anyway. I love you anyway. And he made us. He made us his children. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. For as it says in the Revelation, the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And you, O virgin, shall call his name Emmanuel. Our God is with us. But that's not the only way he is our Emmanuel, not just at Christmas. He is God with us in the waters of holy baptism. When the word and the spirit washed our sins away and planted that seed of faith in our hearts. He is God with us every time we sit down in our living room or our kitchen and meditate on his holy word. He is God with us right now as we gather for worship this morning. For Jesus promised, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Brothers and sisters, he's here today with us as promised. And even when we are not at church, Jesus remains our God with us as he promised and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age and one more thing I am coming soon and our hearts grow with anticipation as we look beyond that first Christmas, as we look to the cross and our eyes go heavenward, and we know with certainty that he one day will appear in the clouds with the armies of heaven, and he will come to take us home. And we will be with him forever. God dwelling with us. God reuniting himself with fallen humanity. God giving us peace and joy in the child of promise that we might have true, true Christmas joy. So as we begin another Advent season this Sunday, as we look with anticipation, we continue to look for the coming of the Savior once again in his second Advent and in his threefold Advent. His first coming in the flesh, his second coming at the end of the world, and his coming to us each and every day through word and sacrament. And we quiver with anticipation at those comings as we look forward with expectant hearts to the child of promise born in a manger, the immortal God wrapped in human flesh, which comes to save us from our sins. Come, dear child of promise, come. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock with Bible study and Sunday school at 1030. Or find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net.